Good afternoon, and welcome along to this session about Biosender. Uh, because you're all sitting here, I'm going to stand here and look at you. I was a teacher for many years. I'm used to the children always sitting at the very back of the classroom. But usually there's always one naughty boy who likes to sit at the front, make trouble for the teacher. Okay, so my name is Douglas Hay. I'm introducing this session today about Biosynda Asia. Uh, my background originally, as I said, is a high school teacher. I was then at the Ministry of Education in New Zealand for 10 years, and then I was at RIANS for about six years, the, the research network for New Zealand. Uh, but I've got involved with this particular project here. So my job today is to just give part of the rationale for this particular project. So my lovely assistant, Brooke, is going to press the button. Okay, so the, the first thing I wanted to say is that most in my experience do not know about file transfer. And they do not, they're not particularly interested in file transfer. If you are a climate scientist or if you are a physicist uh, or a scientist of that nature, you didn't go teach or researching to find out about file transfers. So my opening statement is to people here who are interested in using file sender, that is most researchers know about their subject, not about file transfer. So I began work at, uh, at Reams in 2013, and I did not know that. I assumed, as a new person at Reams, that when I went to a university to work with the scientists, that they would know about file transfer. And in my first few months in the job of working with scientists, I discovered that they file transfer. And obviously, you know that New Zealand is at the very southern part of the world. We connect them to the global network, so we do have lots of scientists who are sending lots of data to lots of places. I assumed that they knew about file transfer. I was wrong. And the particular person who told me that I was wrong was one of New Zealand's most eminent scientists. I had a phone call from him one day, and he was telling me that he had to send two terabytes of data from New Zealand to a university in Germany. And when this man called me, I was surprised because he's a very famous scientist. I wondered why he was calling me. But it turned out when I spoke to him that when he sends his files, he was sending them on USB drives via FedEx. So two terabytes of data. And I said, are you joking? Are you serious? He said, yes, I've just sent them on FedEx from New Zealand to Germany. And I said, why do you do that? Your university is paying us a lot of money to send that file for you. He said, I don't know how to send the file, you know, apart from on the USB drive. And he said to me that every time I send that file on the USB drive, it always arrives in Germany. I said, well, one day it won't arrive in Germany, and then you'll be an unhappy man. So that's when I realized that we needed to have a better way of doing it. So I went to his university and met with him. Next slide. And by this time, I knew enough about sending files that there were a number of different options that I could put to him. So we looked at FTP, we looked at Globus, but one option was not a good option. The second option was a very difficult option. He just wanted a simple option that worked every time. And that is when we or I discovered File Center. So for the people here today who are working with scientists, and I know there's Barney over there in the corner in the Philippines, he's a man that goes out and works with scientists regularly. I'm sure that covers a lot of you here today in the audience. I'm just telling you my story to set the scene for what I think is a much better solution that is easy and reliable and works well, and you don't have to have a PhD in file transfer to understand it. So that's my setting the scene for the talk. So I'm going to hand over now to Brook, and Brook will now continue with file center. Okay, so uh, these are both on. 
I put it in here. Um, and after that was finished, oh, yes, there's Ben who, oh, somebody's, there's Ben who's the developer of that, and so he's here to answer every question. He's the man behind the program. But we have to be out of here in one hour because the bus is going for dinner. So we know that we were going to finish a quarter to five. Okay. So, uh, yes, I'm Brooks Schofield. I uh, got some money out of uh, Asia Connect. So this is about me. I, I mostly work in identity space. So you, if you saw me this week, I was in the chat of IAM and the iFire uh, program, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, uh, used to be involved in the Edgerome operational team and still work on Edgerome as part of TFIAM. Uh, I have this file sender project, um, which I'll explain more. And I have two other projects within, within the Asia Connect community, uh, the Urdumnet Next project to do uh, IPv6 and uh, um, RPKI ROV um, in Mongolia, and the Digital Edge project with Indonesia, uh, Laos and uh, Nepal to look at how we can use exchange points um, or other mechanisms to reach the RNE community that aren't connected to the NREN. So, uh, file sender and .asia is coming and coming soon, um, and you will learn more about it uh, from Ben as a as a practical tool. But it's also its own project to have uh, an instance of file sender available in the region for you guys. So the the timeline where we have APAN uh, fifty five. I didn't want to click forwards twice. Um, we're looking for contributions from you guys. Now Ben will cover development. There's some um, user interface uh, improvements and changes that are coming real soon now, or maybe not entirely so soon. Um, and we're looking for use cases to see the kind of profile that people are likely to use a file sender for in their own environments. Um, later on, in the next couple of months, we're, we're working on translations. So we want file sender to be available in uh, the native languages of your economies, because while many of your researchers will be, um, you know, uh, OFAE and happy with interfaces in English, you might have a set of users, maybe if you support uh, primary or younger youth colleges, they might want uh, or prefer to interact with their own uh, language. Um, we're going to purchase some hardware so we have our own um, uh, infrastructure uh, to run this on. Uh, currently, we have some infrastructure donated by um, uh, members of Harnet, JUCC in Hong Kong. And uh, we're very, very grateful for the, the contributions of the uh, virtual machines from them. And because we will have hardware, we're hoping that there is a longer term legacy for this project. And we need to look at some services. Now, the value of the project is we can't charge for file sender. Good, you will get file sender for free. But we want to know how do you keep running a service when at least the money runs out, right? The hardware will keep going until it bursts into flames and uh, Ruin someone's data center, but uh, we hope that you know we can get uh, some longevity out of uh, out of that equipment and some valuable services uh, to support the infrastructure we're building. Um, so the ways you can contribute to file sender, uh, the first one is actually just using it, right? being a user uh, and potentially uh, deploying file sender for your own environment. This is good because. Uh, you might not yet be a member of uh, uh, Edgy Game uh, to be able to access services that are elsewhere, but you can see this is an instance of a uh, file sender um, deployed by Arnet. They call it a uh, cloud store, a uh, cloud store sender. Uh, and so their interface is different from the default. This is the instance of file sender that Jayant runs. This is very much the, uh, the default user at this point in time. And so if you have access, if you're either an AAF member uh, to a QE member in New Zealand or connected to Edgy Game, you can probably access these services. But the downside is they're a very long way away network-wise. And as we saw from earlier presentations about shipping traffic globally, the, the traffic uh, patterns are not, um, yeah. It looks like we're consuming traffic rather than having uh, you know, content and services within Asia Pack and, and sharing research data locally. And we want to get to more of that because uh, we want to use up our local bandwidth links and, uh, and, and have stuff concentrated and use the 
the long distance um, intercontinental circuits for other research purposes. And so, yeah, at the moment, um, this is an out of date uh, picture of EduGain, but you know, this is the EduGain profile. And as you can see, we need to get, oh, look, see, it's so old. Bangladesh is not included. That's it. That's not. So we need to, you know, we need to improve uh, uh, the adoption, and that's what is happening in, in TFIAM. And so when the project was proposed, this was sort of a, um, a map of those that didn't have identity federation at all in, and had no access to a file sender as a service, um, those that had um, a federation but not yet participating in EduGain. Um, those with a, a federation but didn't have access to a, a file sender and those with a, a local file sender instance. And so the next way you can contribute is, is you know, a translation of file sender. Um, and so this is a PLE editor. This is the site that's used. You can go visit this or you can um, talk to me later. Uh, but if, you're, if you know people in your community, um, do get in touch because we do want to curate the uh, the translation of file sender into as many languages as possible you actually see uh, it looks kind of scary right at the top here it says the number the number of terms the number of strings and i think there's about uh it's a lot of effort to translate the entirety of file sender it looks um overwhelming but i've worked with ben to look at the thousand a thousand word column that covers the bulk of the of the visible user interface, not the admin interface that end users would interact with. So actually there's a, a lot less work that you have to do to get the translation done for a large section of your community. Because hopefully, well, most users are uh, currently uploading or downloading stuff for a file sender. They're not going to be the admins of the service. And so I'm making the assumption that those that are admins and want the reporting functions, having that wish isn't the worst thing in the world. Um, but if you if you want to uh, uh, make the interface customizable, you can do this through uh, through PLE editor, so it's accessible for sort of a, a non technical audience. Uh, the next thing is to develop file sender, and so you get some more information from uh, from Ben around this. But you know you can go and look at GitHub and look for open tickets. Um, it's, it's developed in the open and people do um, provide their own, uh, own changes. Uh, they find bugs, even just issuing uh, bug reports and good bug reports are useful for the developer team. And you can see many people fork file sender and uh, explore their own development. So uh, there's actually r and in, uh, in Brazil are actually developing uh, own, uh, a different uh, user interface, a streamlined user interface, um, separate from the work that's happening in uh, the Commons Conservancy. And then the final way, you can always pay, right? BioSender is uh, managed by the Commons Conservancy, and that helps the uh, the development of the of the project, particularly doing the things where you're not getting community contribution. And the uh, Commons Conservancy, you can go there, they look after um uh, the funding for a lot of open source projects um their ad administration fees are incredibly tiny so uh they're they're really worth uh, investing in and actually because of your contributions to asia connect and the asia connect funding we've actually made some money available to the commons conservancy so that some development work can continue beyond the bounds of our own project uh, and this is uh, an example of an interface that's been um, proposed uh, out of some other Commons, Commons Conservancy funded work to look at um, making a file sender a, a more modern interface. You can find this on the file sender and news website, filesender.org slash news, or you can go to uh, this awkwardly uh, difficult to remember URL um, to, uh, to find out more. Um, so unfortunately, there's a picture, if I go there, there's a QR code for FIFA, and I'll get to that soon. But so one of the things that we need to do with this project, and, and we're wanting to solicit contributions um, from you all, is what to do with legacy of the, of the infrastructure that we we'll have at the end of this project and what future services, because we'll have some infrastructure available 
um, it will be ticking over. And so if people want an and from the MNA, um, the MNA needs analysis document that uh, was uh, worked on by Tarut and uh, Roshan in the audience, the, the BDUN and uh, Learn guys. This is, uh, yes. Um, things like uh, storage and telephony and library services as other things that could be added and so you know we're open to um, working out and using that infrastructure for uh, additional services beyond the bounds of uh, um, you know file sender because we want to keep file sender the service working um, and actually i have at least one of my students, I have some students back at the UTAS. I'll say a shout out to Corey, who's up at this time of night. I'm not too sure how late it is, maybe four hours later in, uh, in Oz at the moment. And so we have uh, five students from uh, UTAS that are going to be doing some of the development work um, as part of uh, a work placement that they have um, over the next uh, few months. And that will give uh, us some, uh, some, some people in the, in the developer space. Um, and the sysadmin space and, uh, and give them some experience in, uh, in running a live service. And so we're hoping that, you know, we can sustain this, not just through, through UTAS students, but, uh, but through the wider NREN community in getting some contribution of, of sysadmin effort um, to be able to uh, sustain file sender and other services long-term. You can also visit filesender.asia. The web type works now. You can, uh, uh, give us your email address and you'll get uh, notified when the, when the service is up live. But now I have the pleasure of handing over to the Martin, the lead file center developer. Oh, does anyone have questions at this point? Do... No? Stunned silence? You, uh, you're likely to be on the same bus as me. So, uh, so we can talk then, or we can talk tonight. And you know who I am now. Brooke. Hopefully, that's a little bit better. Is that okay? You hear me? Yep. Like you've been cut off. Alrighty, I suppose we're is this on? Is this a video? Oh, that's the new phone. The question was where is the um uh, where is the one to be hosted so the version in Hong Kong? And we have uh, an in principle, but not confirmed agreement with the signaling to host the hardware that we buy in the data center. So that will provide power in that space and connectivity at that point. But we will provide um, the hardware infrastructure. Storage is so cheap if you buy it in comparison with cloud storage, because cloud storage, if the service is popular, is unsustainable. And actually buying the disk. And the bonus of file sender is it's transient, it's not long term storage. I mean, we are going to allocate certain space for each individual because a file is coming to me. How, what will be the allocation of that storage? And depending on that, the total staff will vary. How many subscribers will be there? Where is it? You did the profit in the right? So, so we don't want to get artificial caps. So if, if uh, people are going to upload a terabyte file, and they have the time and attention to do that, then we'll, we'll observe that. We'll view that. We'll get to see how popular that is and what profiles of researchers. So we don't want to hinder researchers in the, in the short term. But we will pass in the own future files around for three weeks. Two weeks a week, and if, if there is demand for large storage, then maybe we'll just um, 
reduce the retention time until the, the file is automatically expunged. Yeah. Well, yes, it's open source. And, um, I don't know something about the problem, but yes. What is the comparison to the network? Okay. So, um, how do you cover this in the ease of use of file sender? I mean, I can more or less talk about file sender and then people can make up their own mind about this because um, as the lead developer of file sender, I don't really want to compare it to other projects directly. It seems a little bit unfair or biased. So, uh, I suppose that you know, answers the question by not answering the question. Um, with the storage, the little green bar that I've shown here, the 4.82B, each user has a quota. So you can have uh, quotas on users. You can get notifications when your disks are filling up. So then if you have hot swappable disks, you can just add another one and then you won't run out. So you can, uh, there's support there for monitoring how things are going and limiting based on if you have 10,000 users and they've all got one gigabyte, you can make it so that you're not going to immediately run out of storage or you're not going to have problems like the next week. If that's hopefully answering that question, there is a, Huge lag for whatever reason, changing slides. So I'll definitely try to wrap this up so that nobody misses the bus uh, between a rock and a hard place, as they say. Uh, Dr. Ben Martin, my PhD was on formal concept analysis and semantic file systems. So all I really want to talk about with that is that I've been working with data storage and indexing for, for quite a while. Um, this graphic is quite out of date, so there's probably sections that are supposed to be green that are not green, but uh, quite a lot of usage throughout Europe. And uh, by coming here and with Brooks' help, maybe we can get some more green uh, countries in the APAN area. Uh, this is what the upload interface looks like at the moment. So you can see your use quota at the top, the drag and drop files, except either files or directories. So you can upload the directory of a thousand files if you like. Um, it, it, this is the version two of file sender. There's version two and version three alpha. Version three alpha is using Bootstrap, uh, and it has a slightly different upload that I'll show in a moment. Uh, one of the problems I think, or the feedback that was obtained from file sender two, was that this uh, screen is a little bit busy. You see, you uh, upload your files, and you've got all these check boxes, and you're thinking, what do I have to do here? Do I have to tick this? Do I have to not? And the encryption, and when you click on, you'd like to get a link over on this right side. Uh, if, you, if you don't want to get a link, it asks you for the email address of the person you want to send the file to, and it will send them an email notifying them that they've got a file. But again, this changes this particular page when you change whether you want to get a link. So it's a little bit unuser friendly in that respect. When you look at the files that you've already uploaded, as has been mentioned, there's a sunset on the files, typically about 30 days. So if people upload a five gig file, they don't need to worry about deleting it, and you don't need to worry about all these old files taking all of your disk up, because every week the cron job runs and you know, deletes the old files, so you're not retaining everything. And this is also part of the design of it. You want to be uh, using it to share a file with someone else, not to host the file for long term. And another feature that is useful for people who are not in IT is when you're clicking on the file, you can see, uh, in this case, I created the transfer, I uploaded it. You can see if somebody else has downloaded the, the file. And when that happen, so you get a full history of what's been happening to to your particular files, which is useful for people who are not in IT, but they don't uh, well, want to have this information basically. And uh, if you've uh, said you don't want to get a link, but you want to actually send an email to someone, there's options in here to send them a reminder if they haven't downloaded the file, just in case the email has gone into their spam, and that way they get a second copy of the email, and they then have two to look for in their spam folder, I guess. On the download page, uh, if you only have one file, basically you only have one option to download, but in this case I've got uh, three different files, so you can choose to download each file individually, or you can choose to create a zip file which contains any number of the files that are in the transfer. Uh, this screen and this style also works for encrypted data, so if you have an upload that's been encrypted with a passphrase, you can select which files you'd like and it will decrypt them end to end in the browser and create a zip file on your machine with the selected files. File Sender 3, which is currently in alpha and has been for a while, has been moved to using Bootstrap to make it a little bit more uh, modern. Uh, and the upload process has been changed to a four step. So now you have the first screen, which is selecting which files you'd like to upload. And then you have at the bottom whether you'd like encryption on this or not. And then you 
have the encryption, you put your passphrase in where you can pass through generated passphrase. And then you have the secondary page, which has the, the choice whether you would like to get a link or whether you would like to send via email, which is nice and obvious at the top. It's not like a checkbox that's going to change the interface magically behind. And some of the lesser used uh, options, which you can just leave as default below. So you can only have the choice email or link and then send, which is, uh, and once you click send, you get to the uh, screen, which is showing you the progress of the upload for the, each file. And file sender can upload in multi-threaded using web workers. So you can have five or 10 web workers running at once. And that way, if you're encrypting, when the CPU is taken up uh, encrypting the data, another one of the web workers will have already encrypted one of its pieces of data and will be sending that. So your local CPU and the network are both fully loaded. At the bottom, I have uh, reconnect and continue. And one thing that I'm quite, I test quite often is that if I'm uploading on the laptop and the network goes away, if I close the laptop and then I go to another network and open the laptop, it will automatically start resuming the upload. So if I'm halfway through and I go home, I can upload the rest. And the idea that I have for this is from the user's point of view, as soon as you click send, you want to come back. It might take a while. It might take a day with a huge file, but you want to be able to come back and see a little green tick saying, yes, that's all going well. You don't want to have to come back and say, oh, no, I'm halfway through. How do I tell it to continue? What do I do here? You just want to say, okay, I told you what files, I told you where they're going, make it happen. Um, yes, yeah, so I suppose with Hammond Home, the upload resume, but the file collections and things like this won't really read through. But the option also to have guests. So if a researcher or a chemist happens to be at another conference and somebody has a data set that they'd like to share and collaborate with, they can invite them to their file sender instance as a guest. And part of that, you can also restrict and say, okay, um, I don't really trust this person too well. So I'll invite them as a guest and they can only send files to me. They can't upload for anyone else to get the files, which if you're doing research is just fine. And you can delete the guest later if you like. Um, the encryption is end to end. Uh, AES, either AES GCM, uh, or AES CBC, I recommend AES GCM. Uh, it has AED as well. There's detail, technical details that are in the later part of the slides, which the bus may well save everyone from. So uh, uh, you can use SAML. You can also have authentication uh, in your local database. So when COVID came in, I added support for having your users actually stored in uh, MySQL or in uh, Postgres. So that way you didn't need to have a, a SAML server, you didn't need to have larger infrastructure, you just needed to have PHP, MySQL, Postgres, it's on a future slide anyway, so I'll cut that out for now. Um, Surfnet and other NRANs actually audit the file sender code, so it's not just me saying that the encryption is there and it's working, it's also other people who have come in and audited that and made recommendations, the recommendations have then been implemented to make it even more secure. Um, at one stage recently, I was trying out one of the uh, attack vectors, which didn't work because I had a, a feed turned on from a previous audit that would actually block that, uh, or that um, attack. So that if you're looking to set one up, uh, you have PHP, um, a lot of the pages in JavaScript because it has to end to end encryption has to run on the client side. Uh, multi said that upload needs to have client side support. Uh, uh, Maria Postgres, I'd recommend a fairly recent Maria, although unless you're running one of the uh, longer term business type uh, arrangements, you're not going to get a, an old enough Maria DB at this stage that will cause a problem. Uh, you can use uh, one of the two uh, web servers, uh, SAML or local database, and there's many storage options. There's many different ways to uploading. There's also a Python client, which is now multi threaded as well, so you can upload from the command line. And your users can upload files directly with Python or using other, whatever other uh, uh, code you'd like to use the REST API with. The server storage is also broken out so that it can either be storing an uploaded file as a contiguous file or broken into uh, chunks, which are a uh, configurable size, four or five meg normally. Uh, an external script, which is an option to be able to do something like Ceph, which I'm going to be using to back or we're using uh, to back their files. And you can also store the files in the cloud, which some people were requesting. I just sort of added some support for doing this. On the slide, Zip64 archive creation, which I sort of touched on. Uh, there's two different modes for that, client and server. 
if the files that have been uploaded in the transfer are not encrypted, uh, the server can directly stream as if uh, create a virtual zip64 file and stream it to the client to download because there's no processing on the files that's needed to be done because they're not encrypted. If the files are encrypted, the server has no way of unencrypting them. So the best it can do is offer the chunks of that file to an authenticated client where they have to decrypt each chunk and then in the browser itself create a zip64 file and then tell the browser here is a zip64 that you need to save locally. So there is a moderate amount of technical detail to get that part to work, but in the end, it means basically if you want to have a large selection of encrypted files, you say you want three files, you click make a zip file and put the password in, and there's your zip file. Uh, by doing all of this with streaming and with virtualized streams, there's no memory limitation. Uh, years ago, there used to be where the entire encrypted file would be downloaded into a buffer. And then that would be decrypted. So if you had a two gig file and you had a machine that only had eight gigs of RAM, you could run into trouble. Now you can upload and download really large files. And, uh, and unless the browser is having a problem, it's not going to run out of RAM. So you could send a one terabyte file on a machine that's got eight gigs of RAM, and there should not be a problem. I started work recently on Terra Receiver, which is the other puzzle. Uh, before it was. Uh, doing large single file downloads and uh, with the encrypted, it was also doing that and then decrypting it. So with Terra Receiver, it has the uh, chunk-based download. So uh, this statistic at the bottom was then the Python REST client uploading code became multi-threaded recently. So it went from a minute to 22 seconds or a minute, well, a minute 25, it's all on the slide. Uh, but you're going to get the same sort of advance in the download if you're downloading multiple chunks and decrypting because you can decrypt, lock the CPU up fully with decryption of chunks and lock the network up fully, getting the subsequent chunks ready for decryption. Uh, some of the problems with writing file sender or writing a, a stable file sender type product, uh, it's uh, it's deceptively difficult. You, you may look at it and say, okay, I can just do a HTTP, you know, um, XHR request and put the whole file there and I can do this download functionality, but then you don't have encryption. And if you want encryption, you need to do chunking. And if you're doing chunking, you want to do multi-threaded. Uh, only a CBC plus Safari actually received a bug report from somebody saying that they'd open file sender and that they could decrypt all of the files. So I asked for more details of this and they were using Safari in CBC mode which doesn't give you any indication if you put the wrong password in. So he could decrypt the files, but he got garbage. So uh, I would also recommend there not to be using a, a CVC. There's other problems where you can possibly substitute one uh, block with uh, one of your own. You'll obviously get garbage when you decrypt it, but it's a problem with CVC. Uh, GCM is a much better choice. Uh, there was a problem with Microsoft Edge. Uh, before they went to Chromium based, where PVKDF2 was not available. So there was a workaround where WebAssembly was used to do PVKDF2 so that it could actually a SCCM type ecosystem. I did say there were technical details coming, and I'm just realizing that I'm starting to get there. Um, so with, with this, you can have uh, one of the great uses for the, for the end users is having guests where I say you can invite someone, they can encrypt. I could be at this conference and I can say, I'd like you to send me this file on something or other, write a password on two napkins, give you one. Later on, you get a link as a guest on my system. You've got the password, you put that in, put the file in, upload it. I've, always, I've got my napkin, so I've got the file. It's all securely end-to-end -end browser encrypted. In the, uh, if I was going to invite a guest, I see this screen, so I have options. I can say, you know, they can only send to me, notify me when they start to upload a file. And that way, you, you know, if it's a week later, you get an email saying, yes, this colleague has started to send you something. Obviously, on the left-hand side, you have the who you're sending it to and a little message saying, for me with the two napkins. I'm the crazy two napkin guy. And he goes, oh, excellent, I'll send you that file. Uh, when you're uploading as a guest, you don't get many other options. You can't see your transfers or anything. In this case, uh, I have the option on for a first encryption and first passphrase generation. One of the features that's upcoming that I'm trying to get support for is PGP. Because in this case, if somebody, for the back page, there we go. If somebody's uploading a file and they have a passphrase, passphrase is not good. 
Um, I've heard cryptographers advocate to disable the ability for people to choose a password or a passphrase. So in this case, if you have a generated password, then the problem becomes the agile problem of how do you get that to someone else? And I've seen people using WhatsApp or some other messenger and SMS, but you're basically using a closed source program most of the time and you're assuming that the thing is end-to-end -end encrypted and the entire security of this case is relying on whatever third party thing you're using to transfer this password. So with PGP, the first phase of this is to allow somebody to upload the public key and then you go onto the My Profile, upload your public key. Uh, it would. My idea here is that people would look at this and have a paragraph saying, if you do this, you will be able to invite a guest and you won't have to worry about transferring the password. And this will be exciting enough for someone who's invited guests before and dealt with trying to get this password or passphrase sent around that they will invest 15 minutes generating a key, uploading a key here and using it in their mailbox. Uh, yeah, if you if you tell people PGP is good in the street, they're probably going to say, mate, what's PGP and get out of my way. But in this case, because they have a value in using it, I think it may actually get uh, some way to use. So once you upload it, if you've invited a guest to Sam, uh, at the moment, uh, it's up, uh, you have a where the encryption was, it is basically just telling you that it will be encrypted. You don't have any password that you need to send the other person. This file is going to be securely transferred using, you know, whatever it's going to be, AES encryption. They're probably not going to care too much about that. But there's no need to do them two napkins. There's no need to send the password over SMS or WhatsApp or, you know, some other, uh, other Zoom message or whatever. Uh, another feature there, sort of playing around with those adding digests. So basically when you're uploading, uh, each of these chunks of the four or five meg, something like an SHA 256 is calculated and sent to the server. So in a uh, HTTP header, so for this example, you've got a, the second from the top there. And then when you download a file, you can come back and say, I'd like to verify this file that I've got. And click on the verify and it will get the digest off the server. You've got the file locally. You'd have to choose that file and say, same. Uh, the other advantage is on the server where sometimes if you're, because the server can be anything, could be uh, AWS, could be uh, using a fuse type file system. Uh, if the SHA-256 is known for every chunk, when the actual code is reading that chunk back, you can tell it to verify that. And then the server can say, hey, this big road that you've got is starting to degrade. There's problems. There's, these hashes aren't meeting up. And you, you, know, you can get a message in this case when this uh, gets merged in. I was also thinking of adding a feature to be able to download the hashes. So if the user comes and downloads a file, they get a second file. And then if they want to come back, I'm thinking if they're not an IT person, they might come back and have the option of looking at those two files, no additional software, all in the browser, and just say, this file that I downloaded three years ago, the laptop's been sitting next to a loudspeaker, it's been dropped. Now, is there anything wrong with this big file? And they can verify the file. And there's no online tools or anything else. So yes, uh, you know, match, matches the verification in this case. Uh, I'd also like to do this digest with encrypted data, uh, but I would really, before anything gets done with that, I would need to speak with a uh, one or two cryptographers because we're taking a chunk of data and then you're taking the digest of that data, putting it together and then encrypting that whole thing. And obviously there you have some relation between the data and the digest before you've encrypted it. So there's a means possibly of getting leaked information or attacking that because if you know anything about the plain text that's gone in, you may use that as an avenue to try and break it. Uh, database design, I think I may skip over that part. Uh, a little bit anyway, I guess. Um, so most of the database design and file sender is its own object uh, relation. Uh, it now has support for doing secondary indexes and foreign keys. Uh, yes, and also a little bit of stuff to sort of smooth over SQL differences. Again, there was a lot of interesting bugs with earlier versions of MariaDB and views and MariaDB and various other database functions. I'm wondering whether we want the terrace under overview or the encryption overview. I suppose this is more uh, giving an overview of how things happen. Um, 
Is there anything I should elaborate on on that slide or not? Probably not, and probably skipping over the code and how that actually happens. End around encryption. Um, yes, I added the option that you must be logged in. So if uh, you have a file sender instance like Arnet are running one, and they've got probably around 70,000 users. So if I'm sending something to someone else at Arnet, uh, I can put encryption on it. But then I can say before they even try to download this and break the encryption, I might put a really simple password on there like dog. Uh, but someone's going to immediately like hammer that and they'll probably break it. But if I say that, you know, this person has to be logged in, they need to authenticate before they can even try to guess the password. So you can use passwords that aren't super secure. I wouldn't say dog would be a great password. Uh, but the strength of the password becomes a little bit uh, complemented by the fact that the other person has to authenticate to even try to break the download. Um, the current crypto is using a random IV, AES-256. Oh, yes, we've moved to GCM already. So this is the encrypt function. We're getting even further into the details. I've still got plenty of time as well. People haven't run through it yet. Um, the IV is generated per chunk. The details remain the same uh, across multiple chunks. The IV and GCM modes, 96-bit uh, random entropy and 32-bit counter. Uh, skipping over that. And the uh, variable number of hash rounds for PDKDF2. Again, if you're not using um, a user-selected passphrase, the PDKDF2 thing goes away, which has a number of security implications. I would really say if you can, and there's an option to make it mandatory to use a generated password, uh, because any amount of um, hashing on the password uh, for PVKDF2, for example, when the uh, M1 uh, came out, it could do a lot more PVKDF2 uh, in a certain time slot than was available in all the hardware, because that's hyper accelerated. Uh, so your hash downs would then to change relative to that. But all of that, the game of how many hash rounds you have to make it hard for people to break in becomes largely irrelevant if you have a large enough generated key that is uh, good entropy. Um, skip over that. Uh, GCM mode uses AEAD. So with each chunk, you have uh, other information, and the IV is part of that. So the IV itself used for decryption can't be modified, otherwise, it can be detected. So the AEAD can be sent in plain text, but it must actually match what's expected in order for the decryption to work. So you can't turn around and say, I'd like to send chunk seven as chunk three, because file sender will say, no, this is not chunk three. And there's one implication with, well, many implications for one main one with the GCM mode stuff is that the 32-bit counter has to be unique. Um, technically, if the random data in the IV was random and you wrapped the counter around, you should have a distinct IV. But if you use the same IV for two different chunks, uh, bad things happen, I think is how the cryptographers put it. So if you have a default size uh, megabyte chunks, then your maximum size in the system will complain if you try and do it is 20 terabyte files. So depending on the network, if 20 terabytes is too small, you'll need to increase your file center chunk size from the default five meg up to say 50 meg, and then you've multiplied out how big the maximum file will be. Um, file sender allows if your SAML session is 24 hours for login, file sender will extend beyond that. So if you're uploading a file, the upload can go for a week. Uh, even though your login session will have expired, it will complete the upload. And once it's done so and said I'm complete, then it will ask you to log in again because your login session has expired while the upload is happening. So if you have a really large file, like 20 terabytes and a fairly slow network and you're quite patient, you may be able to do that. Uh, how the uh, internationalization support is handled is basically a large amount of things in the uh, Lang PHP, which can have tables in there, which if you're on the PA over there, um, this is basically these strings are what you're going to be looking at, at everything. And then there's a small collection of tools to allow you to pull those down from PO Editor and place them into the PHP files, massage that data from JSON. Um, I normally run these myself because if you have contributors saying, oh, here's a change for that translation, you have to then go over the whole thing and look for mysterious URLs or things that people may do that are nasty that you don't necessarily want to have in a, a deployment. 
Uh, at the moment, there's a file sender three alpha series. Uh, I keep that up to date with the uh, version two. So I'll say in there, this relates to file sender version two, uh, 2.0.39. This is alpha seven, uh, file sender three alpha seven. The database design is the same. So if you're running that version in the 2.0 series, uh, you should be able to uh, put the code into the 3.x series that matches and execute that. So you should be able to change between the two, if you like. And the two pending features that I was talking about a little bit earlier, uh, there is a possibility of adding endpoints so that the file that's uploaded, if it's a video, it could automatically be sent elsewhere. And another part of that, which I'm, I'd be really quite keen to be a part of making it happen, is their federation. So if you have a file sender in Australia and you have a file sender in Germany, and I would like to send a file, this is a large file to someone in Germany, and I can say this would be email address or whatnot, this is going to this professor in Germany. And instead of him having to download it off file sender in Australia and pay the price of that large link, the actual file sender in Australia could have an agreement with the German and say, I'll transfer that data behind the scenes. And then another email would be generated and say, that's now local on the German file sender. And this gives, I think, the uh, NRAMs a huge amount of scope because you could look at it and say, this network link would slow at this time and start using the, the times when there's a little bit of available bandwidth. So sort of everyone gets to play a few little games. And in the end, the German professor is downloading the file. It's a much, much faster download. So everybody wins. Uh, people have talked about running the whole thing in, in the cloud. So you have a Docker container and then you put your cloud credentials running and then there's no storage. Um, so this is possible. Uh, there's always been the option of uh, more mail integration on apps. So if you're on an iPad and you click to share, you can share with file sender. And then you don't have to play around with the web interface. If you've got a camera or something and you're taking a photo and you'd like that photo to be sent. Um, or you, you just have a document that you're working on on a, on a uh, phone or a tablet and you want to actually have that on file sender so that someone else can see it and then you can uh, collaborate it. And uh, as has been mentioned, uh, the Brazilian NRN RMP can drop that the interface from the version three. Uh, this is quite early days and the ideas of there's a the possibility of moving to AngularJS at some point, and there's a possibility of changing the current bootstrap interface a little bit in the shorter term. Uh, but I guess also I sort of, uh, this was going to be mentioned on Fast and the Devs, but I suppose this is the, the breaking news for that collaboration. So I think that's uh, probably slightly too early, but uh, better that than late. I'm going to now do a, a demo of the Fast and the POE editor. Stuff. So, I love how the stage moves when you walk around. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Does anybody have any particular questions just before the book does his demo about the, this part of it? Yes. Oh. So the APA or the things, uh, thank you for developing file sender. Uh, as an extensive user of this application, uh, I have to recognize that it's working pretty well. <laughs> okay, well, and uh, I was wondering, anytime I use a uh, phone card, uh, I was just being pissing off by transferring files into a folder by the web. And I was just wondering if you have thought about or if the requests are already playing about creating a file sender folder into own time, uh, simply because I would feel that it would be uh, fantastic. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, with Cloud Store, um, I know we're doing something like that. They had a, uh, you could use file sender just for transferring and then uh, the own cloud to actually you know, interface with it. So um, that would be a great point to, point of contact, I suppose, for that. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> this is quite good. I can stay here and my colleague runs out into the audience. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, just to um, uh, 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 be able to help me in the how you can do the learning material in this. Not at all, basically. There's, you know, there's a, um, 
Yeah, the second one is alternate from there, but the, 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 the optimal compute the host can meet, right? So uh, if you don't have a way at least to for uh, so the to print in so that you can remove that automatically. Yeah, I mean, and the, 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 I guess the downside of file sender is it's transient, so it will automatically expire, and the person could put a very short expiry. There's a, it's, it's governed by terms of service, right? And ultimately, you know the person because the person has to log in with your federated infrastructure. So you have to, um, you know, you have, you have to slap down the person, and that does that. So there's always going to be, um, you know, there's always going to be a large number of bad or good that it provides, right? But uh, some people trying to work out whether something is copyrighted when someone's uh, uploading on personal flow maps or, uh, you know, large genetic data uh, isn't a good, you know, machine function service of working out whether the content is, um, uh, yeah, and equally, if they use the encryption feature, it's unclear whether it's copyrighted material or not until the end user gets it and uh, and distributes it. So the file sender isn't designed to um, support the, the violation of, uh, of ownership rights in uh, in various tools. It's just um, unfortunately a byproduct. And it's the same if you use on OneDrive um, or any uh, own cloud, any storage service, um, or if someone chunks up the, uh, the files in email and sends it to them aggressively, right? Uh, it's very difficult to really detect that. Yeah, I'm, uh, I was thinking that maybe I'll say something so that you know, at least people can complain so that we can um, identify uh, this kind of material so it becomes a problem. Uh, yeah. identify I, I would, yeah, I guess you could hash files and store hashes of files that were uploaded if you had a good and reliable repository of, of content that is copyrighted. But then we would actually have to have the, uh, the moving industry and, uh, and the reporting was to actually provide you know, hash information about files and a slight bit more but our files will, uh, will make them match. So I think it's excessively hard to do them. And I, I think uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, or if your users are violating the terms of service of, of uh, distributing the content that they, they own or manage or have sourced, not uh, just you know distributing um, you know, copyright material, I mean that's the uh, the easiest way of slapping that down. But if you if you have a great idea, if you have a great idea that could work, uh, I was supposed to just to like you know just have a comment and just like you know this is yeah. But the only people that know the content to complain to those that have downloaded it, right? Yeah. 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 I was thinking about, you know, if you used to make it in multiple people, I mean, yeah. that facility is available. And yes. I mean, I have some enough my the files and the uh, applications being, you know, used by people and they, they have to take them down. And so I, I'd like, there's this kind of thing, you know, if it's quite unutilized for the kind of a person, this would be a waste, you know, I, I, and then going back, it will take, not uh, effort to actually clean it, clean it up. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure with any hosting service that you have, your university or your admin help desk will actually have to deal periodically with complaints of, uh, you know, of copyright um, violations by people. And depending on the laws in your country is how strict the law enforce goes. But most um, most admins that have interacted with, the, uh, the complaints uh, are not Issued from the penalty of perjury. And so if the complainant gets it wrong, there's no penalty for the complainant, and therefore they usually don't pursue it further. That's on the local laws and restrictions. Okay, you can carry on that conversation yeah. afterwards. In, that, that would require quite a few uh, beverages at tonight's dinner to um, uh, cover that. Uh, um, this is, I'm just thank you, thank you for uh, Patana and Bazuki, who I believe is online, for filling in the survey. That's why I had the QR code up there a little bit earlier. I'll, I'll look into what the results are soon. This is um, this is probably the editor. I uh, just thought I'd show you because I purposely for the screenshot had it sorted by those not um, uh, not translating uh, the the uh, the language, but you can actually see. Um, the, the variation here, 
Um, and if you see, there's a this this percentage here. I think covers the no this twenty one percent. This uh, this is the if you've done the um, if you if you select the tag that says start here when you're doing the translation, this relates to everything that's publicly visible within the. Uh, Within the uh, file sender environment for, for end users for upload and download. So, the whole uh, range of, uh, of languages, you can add more languages to the tool, and we're going to try and make it simpler to import um, updates uh, into the languages into your file sender instances. Um, equally, this is Arnett's uh, file sender instance. Now, I've already logged in with this, I have an account within the Australian Access File uh, Federation. But for those who haven't seen it, I'll look, here's my presentation. Right? And so I can send this, and it's a reasonably you know, small file. You can, you can see the upload happening. Uh, and this is just over Wi-Fi. I don't want to leave the page because I just swiped backwards. And I interrupt the download, so it started again. Oh, no, it wants me to log in. Oh, well, I'll, 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 we'll have to do that, right? So, in. now the reason I didn't have to log in again, if you aren't following, I am. Oh, my load transfer, load failed transfer. Okay. Okay. All right. No, it did work. So, it did actually complete. As Ben was explaining before, so even though I'd logged out of the file sender session, and by selecting my file, it compares the hash of the value of the file on disk with the version that made it into file sender, so that like, the version that was partially uploaded wasn't corrupted and didn't network. So this is so. I'm glad we have someone like Ben to look after the technical details of making this stuff work because. Depending on your program ability in the audience, right? Some of whose topic is quite dense, but it's actually vitally important that you get this stuff right because you don't, you know, you don't want to muck up um, transfers. So, um, no. Oh, well, I guess I'm in leaving this page because I'm going to a different section of the exact same page. Where am I? Why were we asking? Ask me about it again. Really? It says one of the previous answers. Load. You need to add the files. Select the files. Now I'm going around in a circle, I believe. Oh, I have to hit restart. Okay. Now I'm not sure what's happening. Hmm. Hmm. Anyway, <laughs> I've equally also logged out of this one, so I'll do the exact same thing. This will. This might also have also already logged me out, but we'll see how this. Uh, yeah, I should have. Uh, I should have. I should have logged in afresh. And now this is both. It's not liking this. Okay, I'm going. I'm, I'm really. I'm really going to move away from this page and try it all over again and leave the page. Yes. Let's see. So I don't know what I did wrong there. It's the joy. It's the joy of a live demo. I apologize. Um, is it going to complete? It's getting really close to the end. And then it's going to um, completing soon. Thankfully, I'm going to be saved by our need. Oh, no, we don't need to go to the bus quite yet. Ah, it's getting very, very close to the end. And just checking that it really did upload. Okay. Mm. 
Mm. It is. Yeah. So I'm not sure why. Uh, and so, yeah, this is my slides and this is the APAN wallpapers that I sent to someone uh, earlier in the week. Um, so I can see, you know, what, oh, sorry about the resolution, that's incredibly tiny, right? But uh, this gives you an idea of, of what I've uploaded. And, uh, oh, and you can see one person. So this will actually show you, I sent this to Patch. And so this will be the, the one person that did in fact download uh, this, uh, this transfer that I sent uh, before. So um, yeah, so at the moment, there's sort of two community file centers that you have, unless you're also in, uh, as from Ben's map, I think Gakunin have a version locally for their own people. Um, and you had Indonesia, I'm not too sure. It, it might not be connected to the Indonesian Federation, so it may be a local instance um, where it's available. Um, so soon we'll have a file sender that will be available to a wider audience. And I know not everyone has an identity federation here, so we are going to create uh, like a, a, an IDP of last resort, a service to allow the RNA community to interact with this. Um, because although we want people to eventually deploy their own identity federation, we know that is sometimes too high a bar. Um, we don't want to run an identity service forever, but maybe we're going to be running an identity service forever. Right? That's, you know, that's, uh, that's a bonus. See, this is also because if I zoom in, see, this is because my session timed out because I logged in for a screenshot way too early and I keep my browser tabs open forever. Now let's see. If uh, at this instance, I like to choose ask me again at next login so I can demo this to people with the information that we actually send. Let's see how this session resumes or not. I guess I should um, reconnect and continue. Yeah. Yeah. Although, ironically, it's much faster to send to file sender in Amsterdam from Nepal than it was to the one in Australia, which network-wise, actually, you would think be quicker. Yeah, you think he doesn't make the reference? No, no, no. So, and, and so, yeah, so then I've got it in uh, two file senders. Um, actually, when I do the upload here, I think this displays, they used to display the terms of service. Maybe this is hidden now, right? It's not really Yeah, yeah. So I guess I've already read the terms and service, um, which which says no copyrighted uh, material to be distributed in this. Uh, like, well, it can't say no copyrighted material because obviously copyright is invested in the person who created the data set, right? So you actually own it yourself. So it's no content that you don't actually uh, have uh, have rights over. But yeah, I'm around leaving. So is Ben, so is Douglas. If you want to talk about uh, engagement in, um, with researchers or use cases for a service like Biosender or other services that could be hosted on this platform uh, to benefit your, your end run, um, yeah, we're, we're all ears and looking for uh, contributions. And if you haven't already filled in this survey, um, uh, thanks for those who have. Um, I guess those online can also see it at this point in time. And uh, I'll give you some, not really some extra minutes to uh, make it to the bathroom, get some water and get to the bus. Final questions from people. My question is whether file sender will be available only through federated access. Right. Uh, uh, file sender needs some authentication source, right? And so you can either have it locally. So we, we do intend on connecting it to the uh, HKF, uh, the Hong Kong Access Federation, and, uh, and Edge again as an extension of that. But we know lots of people like, uh, you know, uh, there's a layer 
from uh, Sri Lanka, those tiger fed, you're connected. Um, so that serves a purpose, but we know that there's potentially a big audience that, that doesn't fall in that in that regard. And so we're looking at uh, we raised it into FIM, the, the ROR index of, uh, of research organizations to try and see if we can support all of those who does have federated access, who doesn't, and how we can provide a, you know, three accounts, you know, maybe via just email authentication to get them an account and then link other services to that, but also use that um, eventually to convince people to do uh, federated access. And then there's some. Elf just with the DMU and his entire economy doesn't have an um, identity federation at this point in time, right? And, and they're a big relation base. I mean, uh, because of the grid computing world, they already have mechanisms for sending files for grid purposes, but there's many more researchers that have reasons to ship data sets. They could be videos of, of human movement and sporting activities, right, for, for uh, uh, analysis. And just they're just too big to send an email. And the upshot of using file sender rather than email is it doesn't clog up people's email inboxes with with you know 25 meg files. It's just a link, you know, a reference to that file. So anything else? Okay, we're hoping that federated uh, you know authentication will be uh, you know sort of a killer app eventually, but we know we need some additional applications and services to support that. So just in final housekeeping, you have fifteen minutes to make it to the buses at the front of the hotel. Um, grab the water on the way out. I'm not sure how well we're uh, we're uh, watered on this journey. It's only supposed to be twenty two minutes when I looked at Google Maps, but I presume. Uh, us trying to get through Katnan do traffic at this time of day might be uh, a little longer. Thank you for your time. Um, thank you to uh, Douglas and Ben for working on this project. And uh, any more questions, talk to us at dinner tonight. Thank you. <laughs>